because of the nature of the sermon series that I'm doing, which is based upon the Old Testament text from the book of Genesis. The scripture lessons are somewhat reversed, you know, rather than the usual. I will be reading, you know, the Old Testament text just prior to the sermon. So listen to scripture as I read it to you from the book of Genesis, the 25th chapter. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abram's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if it's going to be this way, why do I live? So she went on to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and the two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red. All his body was like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Yahweh, Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I'm famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. And Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is my birthright to me? Jacob says, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we were singing the first hymn, and I was observing the young children from our Bible school in the first row, it brought back memories of sitting and standing in church, or being in church on those Sundays when I was that age. Especially during that hymn, when we sang the words, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. The first time I heard that hymn, I thought, yes, these are my words. If I'm going to get through this next hour, I'm going to need courage. You know, for some reason, my mind as a child would wander while I was in worship. And we had to sit through one hour and ten minutes of worship every Sunday. The sermon in those days was at least a half hour, and if the people didn't get a half hour, they thought they were jipped. Well, for some reason, preaching just didn't hold my attention. And so I developed all types of skills for sitting still so my mother would not reach over and pinch me. I would look up and could, you know, kind of feign as looking up to the heavens during the sermon and slowly count all the tiles in the ceiling of the Second Reformed Church in the road. Now that was exciting. But then I got a little older my reading got a little better, and I started to read the Bible. I started to read these stories in the Bible, and something just didn't connect. As I was reading these stories, I discovered they were good. They were interesting. They were great stories. 
For instance, David and Goliath. I remember the first time I read that, I said, well, why don't I hear about this in church? The story spoke to me and said that a kid like me could make a difference. And I didn't have to be afraid of those giants, especially the ones under my bed at night. And then I began to wonder. I wondered how the church and how a preacher could take such fabulous stories, such interesting stories, stories I love to read, and for 30 minutes make them dull. Then I studied homiletics. The stories in Genesis have all the components of good drama. There's nothing dull about them. They're filled with those things that hold our interest. Romance, conflict, lust, war, humor, and of course that favorite, sin, especially someone else's sin. And so during the next six weeks, we're going to be looking at the stories of Jacob, and we're going to be hitting on all those topics. Jacob's importance to the Old Testament simply cannot be overstated. He was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And, the later, and later, the history of the Hebrew people would begin with his life. These phenomenal stories, which we heard just one today, reveal a great deal about human nature. They reveal about God, about relationships, spiritual development. But they're also, and this is what I think is important, they're contemporary stories. It is not hard for you and me to see ourselves within these stories. We can project on them and understand our own lives in terms of them. And so for a few minutes, I want to look at the story I just read from Genesis, but I want to see it as a modern story. Can you imagine, you know, were we to read this story today, or were it to happen today, what would happen? Well, you know, a guidance counselor, a teacher, somebody would pick up on it, and pretty soon that family, Isaac and Rebecca and their children, would be in family therapy, would they not? We might use the word today, dysfunctional, which does not appear in the Bible, incidentally. We might use that word to describe this family system. And so they're referred to a family therapist. And her report might read something like this. So please bear with me as I try and put this into psychology. Case number 344. It reads, the Abramson family is highly conflicted. The primary reason for the referral to therapy was because of an intense rivalry that developed between the two sons, Jacob and Esau. They are fraternal twins, but there is little similarity, physical, psychological, or social. Esau is muscular, ruddy, and large bone. His preferences are for physical work, and he enjoys the outdoors. He has a high need for immediate gratification and often makes poor choices in life because of this. He also has a quick temper and often threatens violence. He recently threatened his brother's life, claiming that Jacob had cheated him out of his birthright. The report continues. Jacob is finer featured physically. He appears to be somewhat introverted. Nonetheless, he practices risky behaviors, relying on his intuition as a guide. He prefers domestic environments, and he eschews physical labor. He's an accomplished cook, and is more intelligent than both his father Isaac and his brother Esau. Jacob also has a number of pathological personality traits. First, his personality has not matured. He's highly self-centered, and he believes that the world exists solely for him. He is sneaky, manipulative, and this appears to be a great source of the conflict that is in that family. 
Jacob has a vivid imagination, but has yet to find a productive use for it. He's also narcissistic, and I fear that this will impede any maturity or psychological development. It is apparent that he indeed cheated his brother on a number of occasions. The conflict between the two siblings is exacerbated by poor parenting, isn't it always? Both parents play favorites with their children. Isaac, the father, outwardly favors Esau. Esau is the natural heir of Isaac's possessions and family stature. Esau is aware of his favoritism, and he plays on it, often bringing his father game from the field and from his hunting to curry favor. Isaac also has a lot of unresolved personal issues. He appears to have, to have endured some type of trauma as a child. The trauma is related to his father, Abel. It has impacted Isaac's social relationships and his interactions. Consequently, Isaac is withdrawn, both emotionally and spiritually. And although he comes from a very religious family, he rarely speaks of it, indicating also some type of trauma or abuse. His, his symptoms are exacerbated by his progressive blindness. Isaac is also of low to average intelligence. He is able to function in this reasonably unsophisticated world, but complex situations, especially relationships, bewilder and frustrate him. He shares this with his son Esau. Rebecca, the mother, is very intelligent and seems to be the unacknowledged leader of the family. Given the patriarchal culture, her intelligence is often manifest in passive and manipulative behaviors. She favors Jacob, and she shares these same characteristics with him. Isaac and Rebecca seem to have a working relationship as a couple. But it is neither developed, nor is it intense. Rebecca became pregnant with the twins at a later age and had a very difficult pregnancy. Part of the family legend is that the conflict between Jacob and Esau began in her womb, causing the difficult pregnancy. Rebecca, in spite of her cunning and often antisocial behavior, is quite devout and spends a great deal of time in prayer and reflecting upon spiritual matters. One might conclude from this analysis that the Abramson family is highly dysfunctional and the conflict will continue unless there is some type of intervention. There's a strong possibility that this conflict could become violent. All of this is fueled by Isaac's poor health and questions surrounding the family Inheritance. The report might read something like that. You get the picture. But the question still remains, why is this story so important? I've updated the events, I've put it in modern psychological terms. But the question remains, so what? One more dysfunctional family. Why do they make the Bible? I think the story and the ones that follow are important for our generation because they reveal a great deal about God. The events here are like a soap opera, with one exception, and that is this. God is the primary player in this drama. We discover in this story that God is not bound by human weakness nor by human inability. God uses dysfunctional families, immature and narcissistic young men, manipulating spouses and hardworking stiffs to accomplish his purposes. God's choice of people to be his people does not always make sense on a human level. There must have been healthier families around, surely. Why did he pick this family? This quality of God is both mystifying, but it's also hopeful. Why does God 
God choose who God chooses. But then consider God's son, Jesus. He picked some very ordinary people to lead an amazing revolution of the spirit. Fishermen, tax collectors, harlots, and outcasts. This is the story of God that is revealed to us in these pages of the Bible. And it is an amazing story of hope. It's hopeful because it reveals that human beings have the capacity to change and to grow. We can mature, and our lives can become purposeful. It's hopeful because it tells us that God can take the most messed up family and bring forth from that family leadership. Leadership that makes a difference in the world. It is hopeful because it says to every person who comes from a dysfunctional home, you can rise above it. And it also reminds us, you and me, to be careful in our judgments of others because God sees people differently. Finally, this narrative reveals the way God works in the lives of human beings. It reveals that God does not accept the limitations of custom and norm. God disregarded the patriarchal culture of his day and communicated his plan and intention not to Isaac, but to Rebecca. The custom of the day would be to bestow everything on Esau, the family blessing, the inheritance, he should get it all, because he was the older, albeit for a few minutes. But here we discover that God is neither a respecter of tradition nor of custom. It reveals that amidst the soap operas of our lives, with its intrigue, its crafty craziness, there is a purpose. God is working toward an end, an end we may not perceive when we are in the midst of it. God may be calling you or me to a task that we do not understand nor believe is possible. This, I think, is the significance of the Jacob Chronicles and why it's worth delving into these ancient stories. A spoiled brat, a narcissistic mama's boy, a kid who people thought would not amount to anything, becomes the parent of 12 tribes and a nation that would bear his future name, Israel. A nation that exists four to 5,000 years later, even today. The history, the story, only begins in this messed up mix of a family. And in the next five sermons, I'm going to take you on a journey where you're going to see God at work, shaping, challenging, calling, and interceding in some of the craziest and most amazing ways. But today, the story is of a muddled mess of a boy in a dysfunctional family. It's a story of that same boy cheating his older brother. And that's where it begins. And yet, it ends in hope. And so consider your beginning. Consider your family of origin, your secret sins and your flaws. They are the beginning of your personal story. It too is purposeful. And it, indeed, it too also ends in hope by the grace of God. Amen.